our roots are both radical and conservative. And the tension between the two is why our society has remained free for as long as it has. Neither you know, Adams nor Hamilton or any of the other critics of the American Revolution and critics of Paine uh, would ever abandon what they regarded, I think, as their common premises, or at least yeah. th those premises which they, in fact, had in common, such as natural rights and, uh, and mm -hmm. uh, species of equality and, uh, and, civil, and civil society by consent and so forth. Um, is it possible, is it a good thing to have a conservative party or a conservative opposition that also stands on the Declaration of Independence, or is it better to have a, uh, a conservative opposition that is critical or wary of it in some of the ways, say, that Burke or Burkeans yeah. since have been? I, I think that you have to start with the Declaration of Independence, not only because it is at the beginning of our story, but because it is true, uh, especially because it is true. But its truth is more complicated than simply the first two paragraphs of the Declaration of Independence. There's a question in the Declaration which is not answered. And I, I think one way of phrasing that question is whether or not the regime that preceded the British mistreatment of the Americans was a legitimate regime. Uh, the list of grievances that ends the Declaration suggests that it was, that one of the, that one of the wrongs done to the Americans by the, by the North administration was taking away the form of government they had before. Um, there's another way to read the Declaration as an entirely new beginning uh, on new principles. And that would suggest that the, the government they were living under before was an illegitimate government. Mm -hmm. I think both of those ideas are actually in the Declaration. And <laughs> the, the debate about the Declaration is therefore, in part, a debate between those two views. I think that there's a, there's a Burkean reading of the Declaration of Independence that sees it as trying to save what was legitimate and right about the regime that preceded uh, the, 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 the terrible acts that led to the revolution, uh, rather than as starting anew, starting fresh on entire, from entirely new roots and on entirely new foundations. That to me is a conservative radical debate, a mm -hmm. conservative progressive debate. It's a very American debate. I think what it means for conservatives in part is that we do have to see the progressives that we fight with as themselves rooted in American life. They're not simply an, a, an innovation, an, an imported idea from Germany. Of course, there's a lot of truth to that, too. But uh, it does draw on a tradition that is Jeffersonian in some important respects. And the people who made that argument, the, the Herbert Crowleys, uh, were not simply wrong, though they were not comprehensively right. Um, but it also means that in drawing on the Declaration, we have to think about it both as a conservative document and as a radical document, and as true in both respects. The liberal society uh, it always contains that debate, mm -hmm. and I think that's another reason why thinking about our roots as a debate is a helpful way to think about them, because our roots are both Burkean and Paynean. Uh, our roots are both radical and conservative, and the tension between the two is why our society has remained free for as long as it has. That was not the case with the French Revolution, for mm -hmm. example, which was simply a radical revolution. And uh, lacking that tension went off the rails very quickly. But Americans have always had a legitimate argument about whether we are a conservative country or a radical country. And the answer is yes. And that means that we are always right. going to live with a, with a left-right debate. Depending on what you mean by radical and conservative, obviously. Sure. But, but I mean, who ever said, except Paine, that the teaching of the Declaration of Independence, or whatever you want to say, it, it fit into the, that place, uh, was uh, condemned the previous British government as inherently unjust. I mean, the whole argument of the Declaration is it was a it was a monarchy, which was a good form of government, right. uh, you know, mixed and with some with some checks and balances, as, uh, as it were, in it. But it became a tyranny, and when it mm -hmm. became a tyranny, it was insufferable, and that's when we yeah. had to re had to revolt. Well, so I mean, Paine is Jefferson very explicit. Never said that, did Paine he? is very explicit in rejecting that view, right? Yes. Paine, common sense says that monarchy is illegitimate. But that's one of um, the. I mean, nobody else has really said that, did they? Well, I mean, uh, that's right. But you, you have to ask yourself. Others joined in maybe after he said it. Yeah, I think yeah. I think that Jefferson later on at least suggests that monarchy is an illegitimate form of government. Mm -hmm. um, 
And you know, once the revolution had been launched the way it had been launched, I think there was a kind of Jeffersonian party uh, that in accusing Adams and Hamilton and others of being monarchists, were accusing them of being despots um, and saw the two as simply the same thing. I don't think it's entirely unfair to read Jefferson's writing that way even before the revolution and his private letters that way. He was careful not to say so, um, mm. and maybe he didn't think so. We should read him. We should take him seriously. We yeah. should take him at his word. But I don't think that Paine's reading of the question of the revolution is all that crazy. Um, and so th that that idea is at least legitimately readable in some forms of the Declaration. Burke, I think, for that reason, though I don't know why, never talks about the Declaration mm -hmm. of Independence. We know that he knew about it. He was present physically in Parliament when it was read to the members. He he heard it read. He never uh, speaks about it in, in any of his speeches about America, which came after the Declaration. Two of them did. He never writes about it even in his private letters. Uh, he, he writes an enormous amount about America and Americans. He knew a huge amount about what was going on here. The, the name of Thomas Jefferson never appears, even in his mm -hmm. private letters, uh, except in, in its being mentioned by Paine in letters to, uh, to Burke. So he was very uncomfortable with that element of the American Revolution even as he was essentially a supporter of the Americans uh, in the debate about the American war in Britain. I think that was largely what he was uncomfortable with, the, the, the fear that this really was a radical revolution of the sort that he later saw uh, embodied in France. Mm. But isn't, um, if you apply Burke to Burke and you ask what is circumstantial about his own formulations, mm -hmm. um, don't you have to to uh, raise the possibility that his I mean his own view of the British Constitution is in reaction to what he saw as the premier threats mm -hmm. to the British Constitution and his own gradualism is perhaps overstated precisely because of all the countries in Europe the, certainly one of them to have the most political discord the maximum number of kings hit with heads chopped off right. and of revolutions and of uh, churchly changes and so forth would be Great Britain. Yeah. I mean, in many ways, it was sure. a basket case uh, crying out for someone to pour oil on those troubled waters. And in a way, that's what Burke's yeah. formulations do. Well, I think that's true. But, I, but, but does that argue for seeing him as, uh, as, as responding to his circumstances? Or does that argue for seeing him trying to apply principles that were not actually evident in his circumstances to the extent that he claims they were uh, to, the, to the political life of Great Britain. Burke offers a history of Britain, in the, especially in the reflections on the revolution in France, which is preposterously wrong, right. and he certainly knows that. Uh, and he was criticized by some friends. There are some great letters about this where uh, fans of the reflections write to Burke saying, the British don't deserve your descriptions of them, that this isn't who we are. And Burke more or less says, well, it's who we ought to be. And th the best way to persuade us to become that is to say that it, we already are that. Um, I don't take that to be uh, evidence of Burke's just responding to his consequence, to his, to his circumstances. I think on the contrary, uh, it's evidence of his trying to apply a set of beliefs and principles that he thought would improve his own country uh, to a country that he thought was in need mm -hmm. of that kind of improvement. But does it raise the possibility or the likely, likelihood that if he had been in America, he would not be the Burke that we know. Well, it's he, a he possibility. Would be a more American, but he would sound more like an American figure. Well, but I, I think there's no way that he wouldn't have been a conservative in the, in, the, in the generation of the American founders. And there were conservatives in the generation of the American founders. So I, I, I don't think he would have sounded all that different. Uh, he would certainly have been responding to different circumstances and debates and problems. Um, but the answer that he offered to those was an answer that was very much applicable in America and in some respects was present in America. Um, Burke very seriously considered moving to America as a young man. He was very interested <laughs> in America. As an Irishman, uh, you mean? As an Irishman, yes. yes. Um, a Protestant Irishman, so he would have been allowed to, to, to do it. Um, he and a friend of his, Charles O'Hara, thought very seriously about it, made plans to do it. Uh, and then Burke got married, and his wife, as he puts it in a wonderful letter to O'Hara, just has no interest in, in, in being scalped by an Indian chief. And so <laughs> they, moved instead, they lived instead in London. They stayed in London. Um, but he was fascinated by America, and especially by the spirit of liberty in America, which in, in the American speeches uh, around the time of the Revolution, he's constantly drawn back to that and sees that as what is unique about the American character and what Parliament should recognize about the Americans. 
which is this constant, profound alertness to threats to their personal liberty. Uh, this is what made the Americans Americans. I think Burke was very drawn to that and, and shared in that to a great degree. Um, but he was also a great believer in the importance of continuity and of stability. Uh, and you know that was his case for the American uh, for the American Revolution, and there was such a case for the American Revolution. I think it's an important part of what it is that conservatives are trying to conserve. Mm -hmm.